Y'all ready to study the Scripture now? <clears throat> so I've been teaching on the Great Commandment and the Great Commission, and I'm going to finish that today, I believe. Um, <clears throat> I've been kind of doing like this Part A and Part B, and um, talking to you about a couple different things, and I'll do that again now. Um, I think most of us agree that we're living in the end times, that the events in our world seem to point toward the coming of the Lord at a greater de degree of intensity than we have experienced before. And it has jerked us back to the reality that Christ is coming back to the earth. And that we are to live in a constant state of expectation and spiritual readiness at all times. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, I've been talking about the end time and the coming of the Lord and, and uh, answering the question, if these are the end times, what should we be doing? What should we be doing if these are the end times? And so I've gone to the Scripture for every week now and showed you what the Bible said about what we should be doing in the end times. I'd like to do that again today. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. <clears throat> Let's read it. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Now, the day of the Lord is biblical terminology for the second coming of Christ. It is not a single event. It is a series of events that take place on the day of the Lord. It refers to the end of the age when Jesus Christ returns and ends human history as we know it and begins uh, eternal history. And then, so he said, the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly. So God built into the dynamics that we would not know the day or the hour, the year, but we would know the season. And he gave us indications that would help us to realize that his coming was near. But at the end of the day, he's coming as unexpectedly as a thief. Then it said, the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. I believe in climate change. Uh, I'm reading it to you. The heavens pass away. The elements themselves will disappear with fire. We're not talking about climate change that, that will happen over a period of 100 or 200 or 500 years. We're talking about cataclysmic events that will happen in a short period of time and will turn this planet ecologically upside down. You better know there's climate change. And when Christ comes, when it comes time for the season of His coming, there is going to be cataclysmic changes on planet Earth. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Now, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. So the world as we know it is going to be destroyed. Everything that you and I know as the earth and the world and, and life is going to be destroyed. This is what the prophets have said from Jesus um, forward. That there is coming a day when the world as we know it is going to be completely torn up and is going to be remade. Now, I believe that the earth is forever. That it's going to be burned with fire. It's going to experience judgment. But it's going to be renovated and renewed. The Bible said the meek will inherit the earth. So the earth is not going to be ruined with fire and slung off into space and eternity. But the earth is going to be judged, and it's going to be renewed. Jesus spoke of it as the regeneration of all things. So some terrible things are coming to planet earth uh, in and around the day of the Lord. But in the end, the earth is going to become the habitat he originally designed for it to be. It's going to become a place of beauty, a place of peace, and a place of perfect health. You see, it was originally intended and was that. 
But sin entered in because God gave man his free will and, and man chose to violate God's law. And as a result, sin came in and the earth was cursed and the whole planet um, has been judged for it. But there's coming a day when God is going to reverse that process and the earth is going to be a beautiful habitat beyond anything we know now and beyond anything we can imagine. It's going to be everything God intended for it to be. Now, we've got a lot to go to before we get there, but that's the ultimate end. <clears throat> Let me read just a little further. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along, on that day, He will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heaven and new earth He has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting, say, while we are waiting. This is what the Bible said we should do while we are waiting. While we are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. So Peter the Apostle said that we're to do everything we possibly can to live a peaceful life. Sometimes it's not possible, but as much as possible, live a peaceful life. And furthermore, live before Him pure and blameless in His sight. Everybody say pure and blameless. Now, you and I know that we're all sinners saved by grace. And we all have a human nature, a sinful nature, a propensity for sin. We all know that. Uh, we talk about how that no one's perfect and everyone makes mistakes. And sometimes we all sin. And there's certainly a truth in all of that. But the Word of God does not lower the bar for us. It commands us to be pure and to be blameless in His sight. And if we could not reach that bar, He would not have commanded us to obtain that bar. If He had not given us the grace to live pure and blameless, we would never get there. But He gave us the grace so that we could. So remember this, God's calling us to live pure and blameless life. Pure means a lack of mixture. It's the mixture that we struggle with. We're not all good and we're not all bad. We're just kind of mixed. And uh, God is asking us to be pure, pure in our hearts, pure in our minds, and pure in our attitudes, pure in our lives, and blameless in His sight. I don't know if you can be blameless in other people's sight, but God said you can be blameless in my sight. And that's the bar that He has set for us. I believe that in these, this last day that you and I need to raise the bar back to the Word of God and that we need to bring our best Christianity forward and we need to be living our best lives today. This is not a time to slack off. It's a time to engage at a new level. This is the end time, and it's a time when the world needs to see a representative of Christ that is pure, genuine, and authentic. I believe now is the time for the church to peak in human history. It has been my deep conviction, and I teach and preach and live from this perspective, that before the coming of Christ, there was going to come cataclysmic events on planet Earth beyond anything we could imagine living in or living through. It's been my belief that during that time, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ would thrive, that Christ would come back for a church that was peaking, not to just simply rescue a dying church. I believe the church is going to reach a peak just before Christ returns, a peak of effectiveness, a peak of authenticity, a peak of purity, and a peak of power. That Christ is going to come back not for a church that is weak and barely alive and rescue us, but Christ is coming back, what Paul said, after a bride that had made herself ready. A bride that was so ready and so perfect that she didn't even have a wrinkle in her dress. And, and she was without spot and she was without blemish. That's the church Jesus Christ is coming back for. So I believe we're going to see troubled times like we cannot imagine. 
I believe we're going to see men for, fall away from God. But on the other hand, we're going to see millions come to Christ before the coming of the Lord. And God is going to reap a harvest of souls from the earth. It is my deep conviction that in, in the not-so-distant future, we're going to see millions of Islamic people come to Christ. Christianity and the Muslim religion is going to go head to head and Christianity is going to win because our Savior is alive and well and He meets people personally. And already we're hearing reports all over the Middle East where people are having personal encounters with Christ. Their lives are being changed. They're putting their life on the line to become Christians because they're having personal encounters. If you're a Muslim, you can't have a personal encounter with your God. But if you're a Christian, you can have a personal encounter that changes is your heart from the inside out. Your pastor believes that before the final is final, that Christ is going to reap a harvest of souls like we've never seen before. I want to be a part of what God is doing in my lifetime. Can you say amen? amen. So Christ is coming back after a bride that is beautiful and glorious in every case. And it demands that you and I step up. Um, and be the best that we have ever been or the best that we could possibly be for Christ. Now, I've been teaching on the great command and the great commission. Uh, the great com commission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation. The great command is to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. The great command to love is who we are. The great commission is what we do. And what we do hinges on who we are. If we do not have the love of God in our hearts and we cannot share the pure love of God with people everywhere, then we're never going to fulfill the great commission. I look back at the early church. It was the prototype. It was the original. And they turned the world upside down, the Scripture says. They reached every nation under the sun in the first 100 years. And it was because of the love they had for people that they went to preach the gospel to. You see, if you and I are going to be effective witnesses for Christ, people have to know that we love them first. We cannot tell them they need to be saved before they already know that we love them with the pure love of Christ and love them the way that God loves all of us. And so love's got to drive the great commission. Love has to open the ground so that we can sow the seed in. The church was scattered all over the planet uh, and every nation, cultures that did not know Christ, cultures that opposed or were completely ignorant of the Jewish religion. But when they went in there with the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, churches were born, and uh, every nation in the first century heard the gospel and had a representation of Christianity there because of the purity of their love and the fervency of their faith. I believe it's that kind of purity and fervency that we need today. You know, Christ gave His his followers a clear mandate in Matthew 28, a clear mandate. He said, go and tell everybody. Go and preach. Go and teach. Tell other people about what you have experienced and what you have learned. Tell them, teach them, preach to them. And it was on that basis that the world was turned upside down in the first century. That Christianity went from a tiny segment of believers to covering the world and became the dominant religion in just a few years. The fact is, the people went out and told everybody. It was his mandate. It was his, their mission to tell others about Christ. Then he said, make disciples. Disciples. Now, side note. <clears throat> I think it's important that we hold on to our Bible words and that we have a biblically-based vocabulary. Because when you lose certain Bible words that aren't being used in our modern vocabularies, you lose the concept. You lose the truth when you lose the Bible word. So we've got to hold on to some words because they contain great truths that the world needs. For instance... The word redemption. 
Not a word a lot of people use, not really commonly used in the 21st century. It's not a part of your vocabulary in your daily life. We really have to say redemption. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's a good Bible word, and if we hold on to the word, we can hold on to the concept of redemption, how that God redeemed us from our sin. Here's another word, sanctification. I mean, when's the last time you're at work and somebody used the word sanctification? I mean, it's not a word, but when you lose the word sanctification, use the concept that we are set aside and set apart unto God and that we belong to God. So I'm encouraging you to, to hold on to your biblical vocabulary because there's some great truths that are held in those words. There's this word discipled. Well, again, uh, it's not a word you hear used much at work disciple. It's pretty much a Christian word, pretty much a word that is uh, used by Christianity. I, I guess there's some cultish groups that were, use the word disciples. I don't know, but it's really not a word we use today, but it's a good word, and it's a word we need to hold on to because Christ said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and he said, make disciples. Disciple is a follower of Jesus, a student of Jesus, someone that is submitted to Christ and is submitted to the truth of the Bible. And so we're called to make disciples, teach people the Word of God, teach them how to apply the Bible to their lives, and to teach them how to be followers of God. We are coaches and mentors, and we train people, and we're helping them in their walk with God. It's, it's primary to the great command. Preach the gospel, get them saved, and then make them disciples, teach them how to walk with God in their daily life. And then he said, make disciples of all nations. You know, for the first 10 years or so, the apostles did not leave Jerusalem. But the original 12 stayed right there in Jerusalem and just continued to minister in Jerusalem and Judea. Uh, Peter would eventually be called to Cornelius' house and the first Gentiles would be saved. But this is 10 years down the road. And after um, about 10 years, the apostles realized that we're not going to reach the world if we all live in Jerusalem. And so the apostles, the originals, began to go to the various countries of the world. Of course, God raised up the Apostle Paul, who was not one of the original, but God raised him up to be the Apostle to the Gentiles, and he preached throughout Asia Minor and raised up churches throughout that continent and made a huge impact, gave us two-thirds of the Bible. But the church was sent out. The church was meant to go and to expand to every single nation. The reason why God wanted the people to go out to every nation is because God wanted people of every nation in His church, in His family, and a part of His kingdom. He wanted every ethnicity, every race, every tribe, every tongue. When you read the book of Revelation, John saw a vision of the people of God all in one place, and he said, it was so many we couldn't even count them. We couldn't number them. We, they, we couldn't even estimate how many there was. And he said they were from every tribe, every, every race, every nation, every kindred, every language. They were all in there together. And so God's vision from the start is for his church to be international and for there to be people from virtually every race every nation on this planet. And he sent the church out. And so for 2,000 years, the church has been a missionary organization, sending churches to places there weren't many churches, places that had not heard the gospel, people groups that needed salvation, people groups that had other religions and belief systems. But the gospel goes in, and before you know it, there is a church raised up, and the kingdom of God has a representative. This is the Great Commission. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, Jesus would say, The good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. And so Christ had in his mind that when he has thoroughly evangelized and reaped the harvest of the world, that then the end would come. 
So his goal is to get people in his kingdom and to get people in his church to be a part of his family. And you and I are vital to that effort. We are committed to that cause, the great commandment and then the great commission. I want to talk to you about the kingdom and the church. Now, these words are used together, but they're not the same. I want to make a distinction between the kingdom of God and the and the church. The kingdom of God is the realm or domain of God. It's everything. The church, that's the people of God. The kingdom of God is everything that God in His domain, everything tangible, everything spiritual, every human being, every building, every dollar, everything is in His kingdom. It's His domain. But the church, that's the called out one, the ecclesia, those are the people of God. So we are the the subjects of His kingdom. We are the citizens of His kingdom. But we're not the kingdom. We are the people of His kingdom. We are the church. And so Jesus said, I want you to go out and preach the gospel of the kingdom. He didn't say the gospel of the church. He said the gospel of the kingdom. And so you and I are called to build and promote the kingdom of God. Jesus preached the kingdom of God. The apostles preached the kingdom of God. And so the kingdom of God is global. It is everywhere. And the people of God are subjects, are are citizens of that kingdom. You and I are called to grow or expand and enlarge the kingdom of God in all that we do. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, Jesus said, From the time of John the Baptist began preaching until now, which was not very long because Jesus started about six months before John the Baptist, he said until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and violent people are attacking it. I want you to notice it said the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. Uh, this verse has intrigued me for many years. It's been forcefully advancing. The kingdom of God has to be forcefully advanced. It has to be a concerted effort. It has to be a strategic effort. It's an expensive effort, but it's an effort to expand the kingdom of God, the domain of God, in the hearts and lives of people here and abroad. That's what Jesus said. It has to be forcefully um, advanced. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he'll give you everything you need. But notice he said, seek the kingdom of God above all else. You know, all of us are seeking many things in life. I'd like to use the word pursue. We are pursuing things in life. Uh, You may be pursuing a life mate. You may be pursuing an education. You may be pursuing a career. You may be pursuing building a business. You may be uh, pursuing raising a family. Uh, You know, we're all pursuing a lot of things. How many of you are pursuing a lot of things in your life? We're pursuing things. And Jesus said, make sure that you're pursuing the kingdom of God first and foremost. That you are seeking his kingdom and hoping to forcefully advance his kingdom and to enlarge his work in the earth first and foremost. It's okay to have other pursuits. It's good to have goals and plans and strategies for your life, for your family, for your career. It's great to have those things. That's part of life. But Jesus said, make sure that you're seeking first the kingdom of God. And if you'll put him first, he said, all these other things, they'll fall in line. Now, in modern America, there is a huge amount of teaching about dreams, your dream, your goal, your vision. Um, And there's nothing wrong with encouraging people to have a dream, to pursue a dream, to dream big, and don't let anybody steal your dream. There's nothing wrong with any of that. That's all good. But it's not in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible will it tell you to uh, pursue your dream or to dream big. Don't let anybody steal your dream. The Bible doesn't say that. I I don't want to disappoint you, but that's not a Bible teaching. The Bible said, seek first the kingdom of heaven. 
It doesn't say seek your dream and your vision and what you want to do in life. He said, serve the Lord. If you love me, he said, you will do my will. So it's okay to have dreams and visions and pursuits and things you want. I certainly have a life full of those. But I have to put God first and foremost. You've heard me say before, you know, we tell our little kids because we want them to be confident and we want them to be Uh, We want them to have forward motion in their lives, and we want them to do well. And so we tell them to dream, and they can be anything they want to be. So dream big and just be anything you want to be. And we know we're lying when we say it. We know we're lying when we say it. You can't be anything you want to be. You can't be anything you want to be. If I could be anything I wanted to be, I'd have about four Super Bowl rings on those hands right there. But I can't be anything I want to be. I'd like to be a fabulous guitarist and have a a big set of pipes and a great vocalist and be able to rattle the house. But that ain't going to happen because I can't be everything I I want to be. I'd like to have more more money than I could possibly spend. But I don't, and I never will. Because I can't be everything I want to be, and I can't do everything I want to do. All I can do is find out what potential God built into me, what plan He has for my life, and try to maximize that. But we don't tell our kids that. We don't tell our kids that. (laughs) Hand them a college curriculum and look through the pages and say, just pick something. Whatever you want to do, just just pick it. If you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a lawyer, you want to be a nurse, whatever you want to be. You want to be an engineer, just pick something. Well, I know what we're doing. We're trying to get them to dream and encourage them to move their life forward. But at some point, every one of us has to come to the reality that I can't just pick something and go be something. I have to get on my knees and say, God, why was I born? What did you have in mind for my life? What road do you want me to walk? Now, God will give you the desires of your heart, and God will honor the things you love and cherish. But we have to first submit our will to God and say, God, it's not about what I'm dreaming. It's about your dream. It's not my plans. It's your plans. The Bible teaches that man makes his plans, but the Lord orders his steps. Oh, we, I've got a life full of plans. I'm a big planner. I've got a plan for everything. A whole bunch of them never come into play because somehow they change. And I think planning is important. But at the end of the day, God is ordering my steps, and what He does is important. So all I'm saying is that we need to make the Great Commission our personal commission in life. And we pursue the kingdom of God first and foremost. Now, I really think it's healthy to merge your personal sense of ministry, mission, calling of God, and your career track. Whatever career track you're on. Um, I want to pray for Percy. Don't let me forget it. Um, Whatever career track you're on, it's real important that you merge your sense of ministry and destiny on the road you're walking. Whatever job you have, whatever business you're in, whatever, whatever you're pursuing, I really believe it's important that you realize that I am in this position because I'm an ambassador of Christ. You know, we're not all called to get on airplanes and fly around the world and preach the gospel to other nations or to load up our families and become a missionary somewhere. But we we all have a world. We all have people we interact with. We're all on a track. And God has arranged for us to be at certain places and meet certain people and interact with people. And we are the missionary to our world. You see, you'll meet people I'll never meet, and the person beside you will meet people you will never meet because you have a world, and you're the light of that world, and you're the missionary, the ambassador of Christ to the world you live in. And when you realize, you know what, I got this job, and I I, I don't know how I got here, but I just believe that God has me here, and whether I'm here a short time or a long time, I'm God's ambassador in this world. I'm His light. I'm His missionary, and I'm here to show the pure love of God and share the good news of Jesus and help people know how to be disciples of Christ. You see, you got to take that great commission and boil it down to you and your life that you're living right now. And Jesus said, make that first. And if you will, 
Everything else will come around for you. It'll happen. But you put him first. You can't put God second. He's always got to be first. Can you say amen? amen? So I believe with all of my heart that the great commission is driven by the great command to love, to preach the gospel, help people become Christians. It's our mission. It's why we exist. It's what we're all about. You know, um, it's easy to get caught up in life, to get caught up in pursuits of life, to get caught up in the pain of life, and forget your real mission in life. To get on a track and get on a plan and forget that God has a plan and God has a purpose and things don't happen by accident. The providence of God is seen in the fact that He lets us make decisions and other people around us are making decisions, but He controls the outcome. And you can be at a place you never thought you would be in a place you don't want to stay very long, but you can say with confidence that God has me here for a reason and I want to, be, I want to fulfill that reason. And when that reason is fulfilled, maybe another door will open up. But I'm in the place that God has me, and I'm going to be let God use me in this time and in this place. I really believe that there, this is a day for some recommitment and renewing of our commitment to Christ, our commitment to being the best Christian we can be, our commitment to using our gifting and our anointing and what God has put in us to begin to use it in whatever season of life you're in, whatever station of life you're in, whatever business arena you're in, if you're in education, uh, whatever you're doing is to really begin to see yourself playing a vital role as an ambassador of Christ, expanding, forcefully expanding the kingdom of God. So no, we, you may not can reach the world, but you can reach the world that you live in. And you are the ambassador and the light of that world. Maybe someone has been distracted overwhelmed by pain and disappointment, and you've lost sight of your mission and your purpose, lost sight of the gifting and the calling of God in your life. Life happens. The devil is a master of distraction. And sometimes we have to be called back to the center line. Of, this is what my life's about. This is what's most important to me. And this is what I'm going to do first. And then everything else is going to be after that. I believe that there are gifts laying dormant in the body of Christ in our church. I believe there are gifts that are stagnant and a bit rusty. I know something about gifting, and I can tell you, when you don't use them, they get rusty. When you don't use them, they're not quite as sharp. They're not quite as accurate. They're not quite as detailed when you don't use it. Your prophetic gift your discerning gift, your word of knowledge, your word of wisdom, sharing your testimony. The less you share it, the less effective you become in it because your gifts have a way of rusting. They have a way of getting dull. But the more you use your gift, the sharper, the more accurate, and the more effective they have. So I believe that there are some rusty gifts that God wants to shine up, put some oil on, and get active in the body of Christ. I'm calling you today to join with me in being the best Christian you've ever been, the best servant of God you've ever been, and being the best person you could possibly be because of the days that we live in. You can close your Bibles and I'll cut your devices off now. I want to have prayer, and uh, I'd like to open the altar. If there's someone that would like to come down and have a moment of private prayer and devotion from right now until you leave, I want to open this altar so people can come and just have a moment of prayer. The Spirit of the Lord is speaking um, individually.